ahead and get started. Hopefully we get a few more stragglers in a couple of minutes. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think everyone here knows me. Um, this is the final Wheatland seminar of the semester, so um, good to have you here. And uh, we're excited to have Dr. Casey Regard, one of our own, uh, here for uh, this afternoon's seminar. Uh, Casey was born and raised in southern Idaho uh, while completing a BS in math and computer science at Idaho State University. I uh, spent a couple of summers uh, working at the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, where his interest turned toward remote sensing. Uh, soon after that, he met uh, his future wife, Erin uh, Simons, uh, and she entered uh, grad school in biology. Uh, easily distracted, Casey spent uh, the next two years completing a biology degree. Uh, Casey and Aaron moved to Maine in 2001, where Casey enrolled in the UMaine School of Marine Science to complete a master's working with Andy Thomas in his satellite oceanography data lab. Uh, during that time, Casey spent three long weeks on a research cruise off the Oregon coast, mostly pining for the Oregon Coast Range, uh, in between periods of prolonged seasickness. So I'm sure there's some good stories related to, to that. <laughs> Uh, soon after that, uh, Casey enrolled in the uh, Forest Resources PhD program uh, here at UMaine, working with uh, Steve Sater in the Maine Image Analysis Lab. Uh, prior to writing his dissertation, Casey accepted a soft money research position, which gave him lots uh, of great reasons to not work on his PhD. Uh, Casey did eventually finish uh, this past spring. Uh, and for uh, more than 10 years, Casey has worked with Landsat imagery to characterize forest landscapes and landscape change. Uh, during much of that time, he has focused on the development of machine learning approaches to improve forest mapping outcomes. So with that, uh, let's welcome Casey. Thank you, Thank you so Okay, so today I'll be talking about an initiative uh, we have called Intelligent Geosolutions for better or for worse. Hopefully we kind of live up to the name at some point. Um, we've been working on this the for- The intelligent part or the geo part? <laughs> well, the geo part I think just comes with the territory. It's the intelligent part I think we write out, but um, we've been working on it for, I guess actually we're approaching a year on it. So a little while ago, it was a little misleading, but um, Aaron and Aaron and I have been collaborating for almost 10 years now on various projects, so. Um, this is kind of a culmination of sort of long-term thinking. So Intelligent Geosolutions is housed in uh, CRSF and the Center for Research on Sustainable Forests. Uh, its purpose is really to engage with private industry to bring uh, forest maps to market and to support further R&D on those map products that's really targeted to those end users. Uh, there's really no base funding for this, so essentially we're, we're trying to fund it off of the, essentially the sale of map data to private industry and to government agencies as well. So the idea is that hopefully we're producing stuff of worth and, you know, if we produce it cheaply enough, people will be willing to buy it. And through that, we can sustain further development of those products. That can happen through just the, what we would call the licensing of a map product for a one-time fee. It's basically a simple sale. We are also interested in establishing uh, sort of collaborative research or service arrangements with industry uh, to look at that R&D process. We are also essentially, you know, still interested in forest research. So all this data is free to use for research purposes. If we collaborate with somebody on a research uh, project, the data comes along with it. But again, this is based on the premise that there's still demand for better and cheaper data and that we can supply better and cheaper data. The data that we're interested in, in producing uh, primarily would arise through the Landsat and Sentinel satellite program. So these is sort of moderate resolution, multispectral uh, remote sensing data, 20 or 30 meter pixel resolution stuff. We're interested in producing maps of tree species distribution, abundance, forest types, disturbances, regeneration status, vulnerability to different forest pests, uh, forest health and productivity wildlife habitat and ecosystem services, landscape change, sort of a long list, whatever we can get at via Landsat and Sentinel, we're kind of interested in pursuing. Uh, mostly we're interested in products though, that are of, of, of higher value to forest landowners and managers and that we think are currently unavailable or are still too expensive or just don't yet meet the needs of users. 
So for the purposes of, of the talk today, I'll be focusing on tree species maps and disturbance maps. These sort of serve as a foundation for producing other data and they're also you know, of high value to management. They're our current focus. Okay, so you might ask, I mean, we're in the world of big data, right? So there's a lot of publicly available uh, data on forest disturbance in particular. And over the past few years, there's been this kind of profusion of time series algorithms and time series products out of the Landsat Archive. And uh, Warren Cohen and like just about everybody else, uh, recently published an intercomparison of output from these different algorithms. And they compared it to uh, human interpreted data. That's this time sync series right here. So that's kind of the gold standard here. And what they found, as you can see, is that uh, most of these algorithms either chronically overestimate or underestimate forest disturbance. Now, to understand what's really kind of going on there, you kind of have to think about omission and commission error. I mean, every disturbance product is going to have error. And the real question is whether your errors of omission balance your errors of commission. An omission error would be a uh, true forest change event that you miss, right? Commission error would be a no change patch of forest, some that you inappropriately label as having changed, is disturbed. And what you can see is that uh, focusing in on, a, on an algorithm, say the VCT algorithm here in red, it chronically underestimates disturbance. And the reason why it does that has very high omission errors. So this is omission on the x-axis and commission on the y. Has very high omission error, relatively low commission error. It's like missing stuff, and it's not making up for all of that missing stuff with uh, inappropriately labeling stuff as disturbed, right? So it's it's just underestimating the area. And you have other products, like these guys in blue, or well, dark blue, um, overestimating disturbance. And it's on the other side of the line, right? Higher commission error, slightly lower omission error. Um, and what that also points out, you don't have to have much of an imbalance between the two in order to grossly over or underestimate disturbed air. So it doesn't take much on either side of that line before you're way off. And another thing that's worth pointing out, so some algorithms get it relatively right on average, and you know, this very bad algorithm in particular does a pretty good job, but if you look at the numbers on the X and Y axis, it's doing that at about 70% omission and commission error. So that's 30% right, 70% wrong. Right? So this is, uh, there's now a national data set out there produced by the North American Forest Dynamics Program. It's derived from that vegetation change tracker algorithm. And according to their validation efforts, it does a little bit better job. But the uh, user and producer accuracy, which is just a reflection of this omission and commission error, they're bouncing around at about 0 0.5, so you know, half right, half wrong. And again, where, uh, where these two measures of accuracy do not match, you're either over or, or underestimating disturbed area. This is a um, recent result from the Forest Health Program, the U.S. FS Forest Health Program, their Operational Remote Sensing uh, Program. So each row here is reporting uh, the, the accuracy or error rates associated with a different product that falls into that program. And here they have sort of the reference disturbed area. Here's their predicted disturbed area. And generally speaking, you have very high error rates and because they're imbalanced, Again, you're either overestimating or underestimating disturbed area by quite a bit. Now, this is data that's intended to supplement aerial survey data. So it's data that you want to provide, and you want it to provide a fair representation of disturbance on the landscape. And it doesn't really look like it's doing that, right? So another reason to care about the balance of error. Um, landscape pattern analysis, so the calculation of landscape metrics, which give you a window into uh, you know, the configuration of forest patches or disturbance patches, they tend to be very sensitive to map error. So there aren't a lot of studies out there, but those that have looked at this seem to indicate that there's an exponential increase in metric error as map error increases. And there's an exponential increase in the, uh, the range of uncertainty 
associated with that metric error. So it's like as map error increases, you get exponentially more uncertain about your metrics and more uncertain about your level of uncertainty, right? It's like, it's not a good situation. The recommendation, of course, is build better maps and build maps with balanced classification error. But they're not very specific as to how to do that, right? And it leads to, you know, a lot of consideration in landscape ecology about, you know, what, what are we doing to evaluate the impact of all this uncertainty? So this is a review of 101 studies uh, asking the question of how do landscape ecologists deal with the spatial uncertainty? And the answer is that they predominantly don't. And specifically with respect to classification there are only one out of 101 dealt with it in any way, looked at it in any way. Back to Cohen et al. Um, and they have this uh, quote at the end of their paper and I kind of chopped it up. I don't think I've altered its messaging really. So users have choices among several maps. It would be irresponsible to not consider how errors might influence use in a variety of contexts, right? But they don't say how to do that. It's not so easy to evaluate how error impacts map use. You can also question if we should really be producing maps that are so error prone to begin with, right? If we should be distributing maps. That is kind of an open question. It doesn't get a lot prettier when you turn to sort of national tree species products, of which there are a couple nowadays. So this is, uh, let's see, Landsat derived maps of biomass from Minnesota and New York and probably just ignore the green, focus on the yellow. But this is a, a validation of maps by comparing pixel predictions to FIA plot data. And what you see is a very strong, what you would call an attenuation bias, where at low values, you overestimate, at high values, you underestimate. And this is a very common error pattern in this kind of data set. Conveniently, you know, if you average over fairly large areas, so just average pixel and plot level predictions over a large area, and especially if you're looking at the yellowish, orangish color here, you know, they look pretty good, right? So that's then used to sort of justify data that has this apparent attenuation bias. The logic is that if you average over larger areas, it looks pretty good. So maybe it's just inappropriate to compare pixels to plots. Problem being, we train pixels based on plot data. So if it's inappropriate to validate against plots, why are we training our models against plots? You know? So this is a, a uh, data that's now available across the entire eastern half of the US um, using the same methodology, basically. It was used to produce that orangish color stuff in the last slide. In this, uh, in this paper, they have curiously started their validation at, at this scale, a couple hundred thousand hectares. So no attempt to look at sort of the plot pixel matchup any longer. Um, and then they increase that scale of validation all the way up to 3.5 million hectares, which is almost exactly one half of the commercial forest land or of the total forest land in the state of Maine. So at that scale, you know, results look good, but at that scale, you might wonder why we're mapping things to begin with when we do have FIA data. It is pretty good. So anyway, and just to pick on one other, one other endeavor, um, this is a data set that's derived from, again, sort of the same lineage of, of algorithm. And here they have validated uh, against, again, sort of plot level averages for entire ecoregions. So I guess my point is, uh, really that the value of this data at the pixel resolution of you know 30 meters to 250 meters depending on the product you know, what is the value of that data to users it sort of feels like is it's gotten easier for producers to make maps if anything it's gotten a little harder for users to really know what to do with them so to talk about us a little bit um again myself and the two errands have been collaborating for a long time on a lot of different projects. They all have to do with uh, forest and landscape change across the commercial forests in Northern Maine. Um, it's a great place to look at this kind of, these kinds of issues because 
it's a rotten place for moderate resolution remote sensing. It's like it's hard to do in northern Maine. If you can do it right in northern Maine, you're probably doing something right. Um, and it's hard for a number of reasons. We have these really prominent landscape legacies of the, the last flood loan outbreak, all the salvage logging that followed that, the Maine Forest Practices Act, and all of the, the, the changes in landscape pattern associated with it. Not to mention, it's a, a relatively diverse uh, forest, you know, a lot of species to think about. So we have utilized Landsat data for quite a long time now to look at patterns of landscape change through time to look at what it what the forest looked like you know, in the 1970s compared to well, more or less present this is pretty dated but um we've converted that kind of information into habitat distributions and looked at things like the probability of occurrence of different wildlife species of interest you know i say we that's not that's not me at all that's one of the errands <laughs> And, you know, for a long time now, actually, we've been, I think I guess since like 20, 2010, we've been working with the Landis II forest landscape model, it's a simulation model, to project how the forest land will change over time. So looking out 50 years or 100 years, what's different under different scenarios. Um, it models cohorts within stands where stands are groups of like cells. So it's, it, it projects the forest where the forest you know, is, is mapped onto little grid cells. And within those grid cells, you have these cohorts, which are defined by tree species and by age. And with that information, uh, it can project change through time. It integrates a lot of different spatial dynamics as well. But fundamentally, you're just tracking what these cohorts are doing through time. Um, it's worth noting that it's really hard to initialize this kind of model. You need a lot of information on forest composition, a lot of information on forest age, and you need a lot of information about forest dynamics to appropriately set up scenarios. So it's, it's tough, it's a tough thing. And this is all to say that we are both uh, producers and users of this kind of data. And that I think has left us in an interesting position to sort of think about these chronic problems with uh, moderate resolution data. So to kind of launch into what we've been focusing on for a while now, uh, tree species mapping in Northern Maine. So, and by, and we've specifically been looking at species relative abundance as a percent of above ground biomass. So we have across Northern Maine, we've been working on uh, all of the various economically and ecologically important species that are prevalent enough to produce decent outcomes. Um, we use multi-temporal Landsat, so imagery required throughout the growing season to try to capture differences, species by species differences in, in foliage, um, as well as other stuff, climate variables, terrain variables, that kind of thing. We've been using the FIA data again uh, to train models, produce our maps. So this has led to problems, right? <laughs> this has led to the same problems that others have seen. Um, where the Landsat pixels in this case are fairly large, 30 meters by 30 meters. It takes about a three by three uh, neighborhood of Landsat pixels to span the areas sampled by FIA plots, which are comparatively, the subplots are comparatively small. So you've got the scale mismatch. And then these little shades of gray around the plots are indicative of GPS error and potential uh, satellite image geolocation. So there's a lot of uncertainty here in this comparison. And all of that uncertainty, both the, the scale mismatch between plots and pixels and the location mismatches lead to this attenuation bias effect, especially the location mismatches, is kind of a big deal. So again, you're overestimating the low values, you're underestimating the high values, and you're basically mapping a similar, you're predicting similar levels throughout, throughout the landscape. You're not, you're, you're suppressing variability. Now, all that attenuation bias, again, it, it arises due to all of that uncertainty between your reference data and your predictor data. And really, it's, it's uncertainty in the, in the predictor variables themselves. Um, but what happens is, as you are trying to minimize total error, you increase that systematic error or bias. So there's, there's a relationship between total prediction error and systematic error. And it's an unavoidable relationship. If you've got uncertainty in your predictor variables, you just don't get around this. 
Now, most methods are trying to minimize total prediction error. Basically, that's what everybody's doing, right? But as you do that, you increase the systematic error and you increase that bias. What we would like to do, and what we've been working on for a long time, is to find a solution that's somewhere in the middle, right? We want low total error and low systematic error. So the approach we've adopted is a machine learning method. We, uh, we use support vector machines as sort of the fundamental basis for making predictions. They're, they're very powerful sort of pattern recognition uh, algorithms. Um, they fit, they fit nonlinear relationships very well. They're a little difficult to control. They're difficult to work with, but if you get them working right, they're very effective. And what we do to kind of control their fit, so we run them through a genetic algorithm. And uh, it's, it's essentially a process of evaluating a, a lot of different potential SVM fits and picking out the ones that you want. Uh, so the genetic algorithm is key for us. It's, uh, it's what drives the whole thing. So we'll talk about it for a few minutes here. It's essentially mimicking evolution by natural selection. So you can think of a, uh, a phenotype of interest um, as the actual model or the corresponding map. That's the thing we're really interested in. The genotype is just a bit string representation of the SVM model. So we just figure out a way of encoding that model into a fairly discrete package, a bit string that is analogous to a chromosome. And then we push all of those chromosomes through uh, different processes that, that mimic uh, genetic recombination and genetic mutation, basically. So these are genetic operations that mix and match information in those bit strings. Not in quite a random way. Um, we measure the fitness of each one of those models that's encoded uh, in these bit strings. Uh, we measure their fitness, and their fitness determines whether or not they have reproductive success. All right, so it's survival of the fittest. If you are a fit model, if we like you, you move on to the next generation. This is an iterative generation by generation thing, so you move on and you have the opportunity to engage in genetic recombination events and produce offspring and create more hopefully fit models. Um, the mutation is really just a way of interjecting more diversity into the whole process. All right, so what else do I want to say about that? Right, okay, so fitness metrics. Um, we use two. That's, that's what gives us the ability to control both overall error and this systematic error, this prediction bias. So we're paying attention to two things instead of just the one. This is all a convoluted way to get at the two things instead of the one thing. All right, so the GA is an iterative process, as I mentioned. So we train a current generation models to large numbers, say 500 or 1,000 models. We evaluate the fitness of that generation. We select some of them to reproduce. Others just fall by the wayside. We apply genetic operations to, to obtain the next generation, uh, and then we just repeat over and over again. Okay, so again, uh, I, well, I couldn't I couldn't produce a picture of this at generation one just as a product of how the code works. But this is after ten generations. Uh, here on the x-axis is a measure total error, and I should back up for a moment. So here we're trying to predict uh, the relative abundance of balsam fir. So. Total RMSC is just a measure of total error in the relationship. Systematic component of total RMSC is a measure of that attenuation bias. And each dot here represents an SVM model trained by the GA. I think there are 500 little dots. So these black dots lie along what's called the, the Predo frontier. And they're really the, the models that, uh, that encapsulate that relationship between total error and bias. And if you focus on two of them, so let's focus on one up here. These models do relatively well for total error. They have low total error, but relatively high systematic error. Down here, we've got lower systematic error, but higher total error. So there's a trade-off there. And each one of those black dots is not necessarily any better or worse than another one. So it's a much more complicated picture than a single objective approach. You don't just get one map out the other end. You get a set of maps. Now, if we move through time, this is after 20 generations, and moving toward that, the origin in the lower left is a good thing. 
You can see the entire population shifts in that direction through time. And again, this is just survival of the fittest. After 40 generations, 80 generations, by the time we get to, I think this was at 120 generations, uh, you have convergence to a very nice sort of curvilinear Pareto front, expressing the trade-offs between those two metrics quite nicely. That little square up there is what you get if you, uh, if you run the GA using a single objective. If you're training to minimize total error only, this is what we wind up with for an SVM model. And it's kind of what you'd expect the error is pretty low, but at, you know, at a cost of a high systematic error. The other interesting point is that if we're paying attention to both systematic and total error, we actually wind up with models that do every bit as well on total error, and they have lower systematic error. It's just like by paying attention to both objectives, you're sort of uh, forced into a more complex modeling situation, which ultimately does lead to better outcomes. So what this means in terms of the prediction plots, so here you see that attenuation bias, especially in the, the high values. So again, this is Baltz and Fur, and uh, you know, these, are, these are all FIA plots where we have relatively high abundance of fur, greater than 60, 70%, when we're predicting something more like 40%, which is problematical if you're thinking about something like bloodworm vulnerability. So uh, for a stand with a lot of balsam fur in it, would be relatively more vulnerable than a stand with less balsam fur in it. And if you never predict and you never map those stands with high fur density, you know, you don't know where the vulnerability is on your landscape, right? So this is an, a model with equivalent total error, but again, the systematic error is greatly reduced. So the predictions are, you know, basically clustered around that one-to-one -one line. Still plenty of scattering relationships, and we're still doing this from satellite. So, all right, so this is a uh, comparison of our outcomes for that same balsam fur problem with a handful of other popular methods. Uh, these are residuals and with the lowest fit to the residuals. So our stuff is in the upper left there. And what you can see from the, the lowest fit to those residuals is that by and large, we're, we're reducing the systematic component of error relative to all these other methods. This is our, it's the same SVM models, uh, but with a single objective GA plugged into it. Here we have random forest, which is wildly popular these days. And we have a couple nearest neighbor methods. The, both of those have been applied over very large areas using Landsat data to get a species composition. So, um, and GNN in particular, that's the algorithm that produced the, uh, those sort of Eastern US wide maps that I referred to earlier. So it's in fairly heavy use. So again, our method effectively reduces the systematic error and the scatter in, in our predictions are you know, comparable to, uh, to what we see elsewhere. And what this really means, so on the left-hand side is a map produced using that multi-objective approach. The right-hand side is a map produced using the, the SVM single objective approach and pick those two because the single objective SVM actually produces the least total error. It sort of does the best job of minimizing total error. But the multi-objective approach does a much more effective job of capturing sort of the heterogeneity, the spatial heterogeneity on the landscape, right? So you've got more highs for the high abundance stuff is a dark blue, and you have more low abundance stuff, which is like yellow. Whereas if you just pay attention to total error, the models are affected by that attenuation bias to kind of predict a moderate amount of fur in most places. Um, we've plugged this into uh, all of the various species of interest for us. And again, it's, it's always the case we're able to reduce that systematic error. Again, we have to pick one of those models, right? The, the multi-objective approach gives us a handful of models. We have to pick one. You can actually pick one that really does minimize that systematic bias, and you really put this line up here uh, and really eliminate that systematic error, but you're paying a price for greater scattering relationships. So we tend to pick a model that kind of balances the two, and that's why we don't just absolutely minimize systematic error. We kind of inadvertently do for, you know, in certain cases like black spruce, where we effectively eliminate the, the systematic error completely. Okay, so this is a matrix uh, right here showing that total RMSE, so total error in the relationship 
That leftmost column is our multi-objective approach, followed by our single objective uh, support vector approach, random force, and those two nearest neighborhoods. And then each row is a species that we look at. And of course, there are species by species differences in how well we're able to model anything with any approach. So that's that sort of row by row variation. But if you kind of focus on the column by column variation, that's, that tells you how our approach compares to other approaches. And what we see for total error is that, that single objective support vector approach uh, does the best across all species. It minimizes total error. Random force is just about as good. Uh, both of those algorithms are specifically designed to minimize total error, so they, and they do it. The nearest neighbor methods, especially for a handful of species, do a pretty poor job of, uh, of reducing total error, minimizing total error. All right, so this is the systematic component of RMSC, so that effectively capturing the attenuation bias. Uh, so just like total error, we're looking at the low stuff here, and what we find is sort of a different, the opposite relationship. So the single objective SDR, the random forests do a very poor job in this regard. They're highly impacted by that attenuation bias. Um, nearest neighbor methods are fairly highly impacted as well. And the multi-objective approach is you know, much reduced systematic error. Just in terms of R squared, the impact on R squared, uh, it's kind of a, for most species, it's, you could pick either one of those for, for the greatest R squared. That's because you know, the one model, the single objective approach is doing an effective job of minimizing that scatter in relation to the total error. The multi-objective is balancing the scatter with the systematic error. Both of them give you a comparatively high R squared value, certainly compared to the nearest neighbor approaches, which for our landscape using FIA data just don't perform particularly well. So we're particularly interested in, uh, in mapping species co-dominance. So where multiple species are both pretty highly abundant. This is one way of building up a map of, of forest types or species associations of interest. Uh, for our purposes, we're, we were keenly interested in, in initializing that Landis 2 model. And it really wanted to know where you had high abundance of multiple species. That defined your cohort structure for your future projections. So this was important to us. This is uh, from FIA data. Uh, so the size of the, of the little bubble there tells you the relative uh, frequency with which any two species co-occur at high abundance. It's really telling you when uh, any pair of species co-occurs, when, when they're one of the top, I think, three or four most abundant species on that plot. So it's a little convoluted. But this is kind of the metric we're interested in. So bear with me. Um, now in this, in this plot, these are, these are differences between predictions, in this case from random forest, and what we see in the FIA data. So you really don't want to see much now. And the fact that you see relatively large bubbles down here uh, tells us that random forest is, uh, in some cases, overestimating the frequency with which species uh, co-occur at high abundance. Um, and giving you kind of unrealistic uh, expectations of how species co-occur on the landscape, right? Um, relatively speaking, the, the nearest neighbor approaches do a good job with this. And that's kind of what you'd expect. They actually, they, they basically operate by identifying a FIA plot that is most similar to a particular location of interest. And then they grab all the data from that FIA plot and attach it to that pixel. So you always wind up with realistic pairings of species. So you would expect them to do well in this sort of thing. They're always going to give you something that's ecologically like realistic. Of course, the downside is they're not terribly spatially accurate. Right? So there's a trade-off in, in methods there. And what we found is that by dealing with the attenuation bias, we can do just about as well as the nearest neighbor method in this regard, but our spatial accuracy is a lot better than the nearest neighbor approaches. Really, the reason why something like a random forest or similar model doesn't do a good job of capturing these kinds of co-occurrence issues uh, is just that you know, you're asking the model to reduce total error for every species, but it's not really thinking about anything beyond that. So it's, it's doing its one job really effectively. That's not necessarily the job that you want it to be doing. 
Okay, so since producing those outcomes, we've done a little more work on this. And so this is our initial outcomes for two species of interest, hemlock, and I can't remember if that's green ash or black ash. Um, two species that aren't super prevalent in this part of northern Maine, this study area where we were doing this. Uh, but the relationships that we derived just through, you know, shoving this into our uh, support vector regression algorithm weren't too bad. We have since uh, kind of a, um, modified our approach to first predict the occurrence of a species. So sort of adapting our, the same kind of multi-objective algorithm in the classification context. We first predict the occurrence, figure out where it should be, and then we, uh, we model abundance on top of that. So we only use plots and pixels where we predict a species to occur, and that really cleans up the predictions. Um, it doesn't do, a, doesn't do you too many favors for a, a super abundant species like fur, but for something that's less prevalent on the landscape, it does a much better job. Um, and our, our hemlock model in particular is kind of bizarrely good. Okay, so uh, back to forest disturbance mapping. This is the other sort of realm in which we've been doing most work uh, to date. So again, we've, we've adapted our multi-objective approach to, to a classification context, and that's allowed us to, to look at disturbance mapping. In this case, we're minimizing both omission and commission error simultaneously. So we're trying to control both at the same time. And the reason we're trying to do that is because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it's the balance between omission and commission error that determines whether you're over-predicting or under-predicting change. We really don't want to do either one for the most part. Um, but error patterns are not random either. So omission error, you know, is patterned on the landscape. Commission error is patterned on the landscape. One pattern might be better or worse than the other. So it actually makes sense to, to, to pay attention to both simultaneously and have the ability to control, you know, the amount of either one. And fundamentally, the, the costs associated with that error differs between one and the other. This is particularly relevant if you're interested in doing something like monitoring for early defoliation by budworms, say, or some other forest pests. Do you want to ensure that you are capturing as much of the potential impact as possible, in which case you want to reduce omission error, you don't want to miss anything, uh, or do you want to really focus in on the areas where you're highly certain of, of finding that damage? Right? You want to drive out in the field and you want to find that location that has been impacted. In that case, you want to minimize commission error. You want to be sure that you're not driving to some place that the map inappropriately flagged as, as disturbing. So uh, just generally speaking, for general forest disturbance across Maine, uh, we achieve an overall accuracy of about 97%. The change class accuracy is about 90%, so that means about 10% omission or commission error, which compares fairly well to, to other. Uh, but again, this is a multi-objective approach, so the picture is more complicated. So uh, this is just kind of a, re, a rehashing of that multi-objective problem of minimizing omission commission error. In this case, I've plotted out user's accuracy, which is a reflection of commission error. If you have high user's accuracy, you have low commission error. It's called user's accuracy because they envision a user looking at a map, saying, oh, that, that spot's disturbed. I want to drive out to that spot and look at it. Um, Okay, and then on the y-axis, it's really the, the degree of underestimation of disturbance on the landscape. That's what you do when you, when you minimize commission error, you underestimate, always. Uh, so this is just the degree of underestimation. So and these are the outcomes from, from a few runs uh, through our system. And then we have kind of the uncertainty envelope around those. But just looking at it broadly, we're and essentially hitting in there, class accuracy is greater than 90%. So, you know, right out the door, we're pretty happy with the outcomes. Just picking at a couple locations along, along those uh, series um, to give you a flavor for what's going on here. So, again, each, each dot is a model. Each dot is a map. But we can produce maps that have a uh, predefined user's or producer's accuracy, however you want to look at it. We can... We can predefine what we want and we can pick, pick out the, the product accordingly. Oh, and I should also point out, um, 
through this process, we always wind up with, with outcomes where you have a balanced user and producer accuracy and where you neither overestimate nor underestimate the service. So you can always sort of peg that unbiased model. Just a comparison again to that vegetation, vegetation change tracker uh, validation plot that I showed earlier. So again, their user and producer accuracy, they're kind of bouncing around at 50 to 60% somewhere in there. They don't necessarily match up. This is kind of a cartoon of what we're trying to achieve. So there will be some uh, variation, apparent variation between the two. That's just because of uh, estimation error. You know, Both users and producers accuracy, they have to be estimated. So there's gonna be some uncertainty around that. But essentially, uh, within a, a few percent, we think that we can balance that out. We know we can do this. The question is how efficiently can we do this? How efficiently can we, can we do this across the entire Landsat archive? But we know we can do it. And a quick comparison to the time series algorithms I referred to before. Again, we know we can balance user and producer accuracy. We know we can do it. It's something like 85 to 90% consistently. It's a question of efficiency at this point. Uh, okay, and to give you another idea of, of, what, we're, of what we're working on, uh, another primary interest is sort of visualization and how you convey uncertainty in the map product to a user. Uh, and I'll show you sort of one simplistic way of doing that that we're playing around with right now. This is what you would typically see if you grab the forest disturbance map. It's just a you know, bunch, of, bunch of patches on the landscape, right? And unless you compare this to an air photo or a satellite image, you really don't know if one is mapped right, one is mapped wrong, right? You just know that on average what the accuracy is. You don't really know anything about any individual pixel or any, any individual patch. Because we have multiple models and multiple maps with different user producer accuracy, all that stuff coming out the other end of our system, we can stack them up in ways that give some insight into what's really going on. So in this case, the orange patches have a very high user accuracy of like 98%. So we're 98% certain that the orange pixels are true disturbance. Uh, the yellow, has a balanced users and producers accuracy of about 90%. So if you want to pick a class that just sort of best captures overall amount and pattern of disturbance on the landscape, you'd pick yellow. The green has a very high producer's accuracy of 98%. That means that uh, if you're interested in capturing all of the disturbance on the landscape, those green patches should get you 98% of the way there. And visually what you can do is, you know, where you see the different colors stacked up on top of each other, you can be fairly certain right off the bat that you're seeing something real, even something that initially you might have not thought terribly likely to be real. When you start stacking up the maps, you gain a little more confidence in what you're looking at. We're also working on different ways. We haven't put a lot of work into this yet, but you know, we've got Coming out the other end, we have something like 50 or 100 or more models and maps, all of which are pretty good. So the question is, can we find a way to fuse all of that information and produce an outcome that is better than any one particular map? And we think we can. Um, so this is a, an example where we have a single map product, and I'm pretty sure this would have been sort of a balanced accuracy kind of thing. Uh, and this is a fairly light partial harvest block. It catches, you know, a fair bit of it. But if we fuse multiple products together, we can do a better job of catching the really light partial disturbance without bringing in a whole bunch of false change. This is a way to boost the uh, sensitivity to light disturbances without, without mapping a whole bunch of stuff that you don't want to map this to. Okay, so I've said a couple times that we can do all this stuff, um, and we can. The question is just how easily can we do it, how quickly can we do it, and can we operationalize all this stuff? And that's what we've been working on for the past year, and this is really what kind of fuels the potential for our GeoSolutions initiative to, uh, to be sustainable. Again, we don't have any base funding from any source. So right now, we're completely winging this. Uh, and it's really just a question of being able to operationalize the data so that we can obtain 
sufficient clients to continue to fuel the development of products and outcomes. Um, we've been collaborating with the UMaine Advanced Computing Group for uh, well over a year now, actually, on a software system that implements all of these machine learning algorithms on their high performance computing uh, equipment. Um, we've also been working on a whole bunch of different uh, automated workflows. So this is all, all of the image pre-processing is automated. Uh, reference data handling is as automated as we can make it. I uh, can talk more about that in a minute, but um, you know, we wanna get this as close to sort of push button mapping as we can get. Uh, reduce user um, or reduce analyst time. Uh, and it's all fed through uh, an integrated user interface that you can access via the web. And that integrated data security plan is specifically referring to our use of FIA data. So we have an agreement with the Forest Service to utilize the FIA plot data uh, within the state of Maine for these purposes. Um, we're working on a national agreement, so hopefully we can reach outside of Maine at some point um, in the not too distant future. So a little bit more about that, about the interface. Um, the idea here is that you have a pretty slick way of identifying, this is for disturbance, so we can identify uh, date ranges and years of, uh, of you know, the, the sort of specified disturbance periods across which we map disturbance and some, some capability to select which bands we utilize. Uh, but you essentially select a Landsat scene and all of the Landsat data has been previously pre-processed and integrated into the system. Um, and then the reference data set is, is automatically interse intersected with all of the Landsat imagery. It, you know, that creates a, a data set which is then fed out to the, to the UMaine computing cluster. You wait a while, you get your product, um, and we're working on sort of a back-end user interface to produce maps out of the models and then to distribute those maps uh, by a certain online map application sort of deal. So, right, so the disturbance functionality is also linked to sort of a reference data editing application. This is kind of like time sync light for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, we are working on the same sort of dashboard for species mapping and have it kind of close to a point where we can really do something with it. And we've also built up uh, the ability to work with either Sentinel or, or Landsat tiles. So Landsat is displayed here, but we have the equivalent sort of setup for Sentinel. So our current focus, uh, we're working on statewide species maps and time series of forest disturbance dating back to the mid 80s. Uh, by working on it, I guess, I mean, we're trying to get the, the system up to a point where we can just run that data through or sort of in a early alpha testing and most of that right now. Um, as soon as we're producing that, we are going to update an old spruce budworm risk map that we produced a long time ago and have not updated for a long time and should. Um, we are, uh, we will be pursuing in the not too distant future disturbance monitoring using uh, predominantly Sentinel imagery actually, and hopefully this would be in cooperation with uh, USFS Forest Health. Um, and we are, you know, trying to fuel our future force projections through all of this. In the not too, too distant future, we'd like to look at further derivative products. Uh, so wildlife habitat, post-harvest assessment stuff, biomass. I'm interested in this sort of chronic disturbance as a time series classification problem. I think we can sort of, uh, you know, plug chronic disturbance into the same system and you know, hopefully get something interesting at the other end. It's a little speculative, but that's kind of where we're looking. And then whatever linkages to LIDAR EFIs would make sense. Um, again, that's a little speculative at this point. Uh, but whatever we do, we're, we're trying to adhere to kind of a set of design principles for this whole project. And one of which is to control uh, bias and patterns of error that impact users. So we're trying to pay attention to what what creates a real negative impact from that use and do something about it. That means we're using supervised methods and that's good in the sense that they're sensitive, they're highly adaptive to the image data, they do a good job, you can automate them quite well. The downside is you need all that reference data, that's why we have an agreement in place with FIA. For disturbance data, it comes at a bit of a cost, we have to generate the reference data ourselves, but we've got some pretty, uh, some semi-automated, pretty efficient ways of going at that. So. Um, you know, again, the, the point is to reduce analyst time, increase compute time, decrease analyst time. 
each product would have a statistically rigorous and hopefully meaningful accuracy assessment. Um, that's something that you don't necessarily get with national products or regional products. But it's built into our system. I mean, that's the benefit of using the supervised methods. Is that, you know, if you do it right, you get you get a measure of accuracy out the other end, whether you like it. Or not. So. Uh, we're working on ways of enabling users to visualize spatial uncertainty and the fact that we can produce multiple maps out the other end means that you can plug those maps into your application, whatever it is, and you can directly quantify the impact of error on that application. So, you know, if you're missing 10% of uh, some forest disturbance on the landscape, what does that really mean? Well, you can plug in two maps into your, whatever it is, your model, see what the impact is directly. Uh, we are trying to reduce costs and I think we've got some, you know, we're still experimenting. We don't quite know what our costs will necessarily be long term for products, but we know that we can get significantly lower than other commercial vendors out there uh, because we can automate the machines to do most of the work. You know, we can reduce the amount of time that an analyst is spending looking at any of this stuff. But we are all the while trying to avoid all those big data traps. So I don't know what you call this exactly. I don't like referring to this stuff as big data. It's like medium data, you know? It's, uh, we're trying to go bigger than we have been. We're trying to be bigger than small data, um, but we're trying to be significantly better than big data methods. That's it. Um, any questions? Questions for Casey? So how, how, how much is the accuracy influenced by the data energy year to year to year? getting paid every year? Yeah, well, it would depend on if you're talking about uh, sort of a prospective disturbance monitoring or a retrospective look at past years. You really only have uh, the full Sentinel data stream for the past year or so. Um, so over that time, if you sort of extrapolate that, I think you get enough imagery to where uh, we can map change through the system either annually or multiple, you know, multiple intervals over a year. Um, so, you know, two or three times a year we can be producing output that is generally speaking, clear view, cloud free type stuff, you know. Uh, but if you're looking back through time, if you're working with the Landsat archive due to cloud cover in Maine, Again, Maine is not an easy place to do this sort of thing. Uh, if, uh, if you're in Maine and you're looking at that sort of data product, you really have to think in terms of every other year, probably get you know, clear view coverage of large areas. Uh, the accuracy uh, that you lose jumping from an annual detection to biannual kind of thing, or biennial, is not that significant really. It's when you jump to three or four year gap or something like that see a significant impact. Um, so I think we're, for us, for our research interests, we would produce a biennial change product going back to the 80s and stick with that. Um, but it'd be easy enough to, to just run a different problem set through the system and, and produce an annual time series. Um, you would just have some gaps introduced by cloud cover. I don't think you'd gain a whole lot in terms of accuracy. Moving forward, we can do it every year. We can we can be quite flexible moving forward with some. So that's the idea. So the difference when you are show, you are comparing the the, the Cohen paper, um, but you, what you're talking about is not a time series segmentation. You load in annual or every two year. You're compositing or you're picking like a. Well, we'd be compositing within a year, so and and essentially have a growing season composite. And sort of detecting the change between, mm -hmm. and you're looking at biomass decrease and increase, or cover decrease and increase between two years, or just this one? Decrease, although we can feed the same data through the system and look for increase. I mean, we can classify positive changes in things just like we classify negative changes. So the system is fairly flexible in that we can. It's just kind of a question of how you specify the problem. Um, I mean, the, the machine learning algorithm just sees numbers. So it's just kind of a question of what you want to get out the other end. The big difference is that uh, we're not geared up to try to capture long, slow disturbance. 
right? Is that so, what you mean when you said chronic? Risk? Yeah, yeah. So like you know, sort of a long term, uh, you know, reduction in whatever greenness or something. Like that, right? So we're we're not really wired to do that yet. Um, and I think there are ways that we could get there pretty quickly, uh, but those ways are a little speculative. And I don't know how they compare to the time series approaches. And the issue with you know comparing those time series approaches is kind of a question of what are you comparing? Some of them are more uh, geared toward identifying those long-term subtle changes and some are not. So that's part of the disagreement. You know, so uh, have parameters that will repeat it one, I guess. So yeah, and, and you know, those are all adjustable. The, the difficulty is in controlling those adjustments. So, you know, with our with our approach, because it's a supervised approach, it's not an unsupervised kind of kind of deal, right? And we have training data that's driving all of this on a scene by scene basis. Um, you know, you, you can really uh, dial in the response that you want. Um, this might be a geo solutions question, like the actual what you're doing here, what you're making. Because um, it's a little confusing. If you, so, a couple is one is that you, you in order to do this disturbance, that's going to, or either one, I know I, how you're doing the species mapping. The disturbance one, you, question A, you haven't, you or somebody like went through and made this gigantic, you sat down with like a lot of coffee and did time sync for no. months on, you think this? No, <laughs> no, no. Um, that's a question of, of how efficiently we can produce all that data. So, but what we found is that uh, if, if, we, if we set up a, a really bad day for me and, uh, and I spend all day producing reference data for one scene, one time interval, and a lot of it. Uh, and we produce some good models out of that. One bad day for me. Um, we can extrapolate those models scene by scene, cross scenes, or through time. And they extrapolate pretty well if you pre-process the imagery appropriately, right? You normalize all the imagery so that image by image it looks the same. What we're doing though is, is adjusting that a bit. We are, uh, extrapolating um, models to produce new training data and then we ask the machines to tell us which training data samples are less certain than others and then somebody gets in there and verifies that's where that time seems light comes in. so we can actually dig in there and say we extrapolate another 500 training samples to be time interval you don't want to look at all 500 of those that's, that's where you create these really big training problems that take a long time for someone to but what we can do is we can identify the 5% or so of those samples that the machines, you know, are less certain about. It's like 95% of the time, they know, just as well as you know, that there's no change there. Or there's an obvious change there. If it's clear cut or if it's no change, they know. Um, it's the sort of, you know, light partial harvesting type stuff where is that, is that true change or is that some phenological thing that you don't really want to capture? And that's where an analyst would get in there and actually do something. But it's a relatively small number. So our thinking is that we can do that pretty efficiently. We're still working on it. So that. Okay. that was my part B question. So it's still, a, it's still a, in progress developing all those. And I guess presumably you could always add more. I was just wondering because it's like, why don't you just make one map and be done with it? Why is it like you have to go on and like the geo solutions and oh, and today I want a different map? It's always the same map, isn't it? You, or, I guess you. It, it uh, you know, it could be. Um, but uh, specifically talking about disturbance, you know, we'd like to produce disturbance data back through time, and we want uh, the omission and commission error to be balanced every time step. So we want a consistent prediction every time step in every location. So scene by scene, interval by interval, we want to know that what we're getting out the other end doesn't substantially over or underestimate any. Um, and that's where you have to control it with more reference data, unfortunately. Um, you know, there, there are different ways that we could do that. We could, uh, we could make it more efficient by sort of looking across time and uh, allowing a single model to predict across five or 10 years or something like that, or you know, one big map all with the same training data set. You lose the control over those over and under predictions, which is a fairly big deal even spatially. So even looking at Maine, one land set seems not the same as the other. It's like uh, we picked a long time ago, we picked one scene to work at. Seemed like it would be representative, and it's like every time we look at it for a different reason, it's not like all the other land sites, right? So we get different patterns of error. 
scene by scene unless we really try to control it. So that's the idea. Which is why it's not a, it's not exactly a big data solution. I mean, it's you know we're not we're not telling a machine to uh, to dredge through the, the archive and generate massive quantities of data one time. To do that requires some sacrifice. So this isn't that. I don't think we're going to be producing national maps here. But I think we can produce a statewide product pretty efficiently. Um, regional products relatively efficient. Species mapping is a lot easier in that sense. It's a lot more computing time, but a lot less personal. So you made the point early that people don't like to think about error. About 1% of people don't think about error. And now you're kind of saying that error is more complex and there's other aspects of error you should think about. Are there challenges then communicating that error appropriately to the people that are that can use these products in the I think so. Um, we were told very early on, so we engaged in a, a university-led uh, commercialization accelerator program. We were told very early on, don't use the word error. Just accuracy, don't talk about error. Which makes talking about this stuff kind of, kind of hard because that's what we think about it, it's error stuff. And I don't know the solution to that. I think it's, uh, it doesn't work to try to use the word error. And um, I don't know, I think, uh, I think it's important as a user to understand that every product that you pick up has got some kind of a flaw lurking in it. And the question is, does that flaw really impact what you want to do? And there are a lot of maps out there that are 70 or 80% accurate or something like that, which doesn't sound too great, but they wouldn't necessarily, that level of error wouldn't necessarily impact what you want to do with it. So that's good. Um, you know, we can produce species predictions that for some of these species that are just hard to map, you know, they're not that stellar. You know, our R squared is pretty low in some cases. Um, but when you smash that all together and try to produce a forest type product at the other end, or you want to identify where a particular species of interest is or something like that, um, by playing those games with the air, we can deliver a product that really addresses the user. So, you know, we might not be able to map black ash very well on average, but we can produce a product that has a very high user accuracy for black ash. That means that if you really want to find a black ash stand, theoretically, if you look at our map, you know, it would tell you something valuable. You know, the, the co, well, it's okay. That'd be, that'd be a little omission error, right? So the, the commission error would be, nah, that'd be a little commission error. The omission error might be high. I mean, we might miss a lot of uh, black ash things, but the ones we do hit, we can have confidence. So error is complicated. Um, it's not necessarily easy to talk about, but you know, I think if you embrace it to a certain extent, you know, you can produce something at the other end that's a lot. Any other questions for Casey? Okay, as is customary, we're going to reconvene at uh, Tim's tap room. Uh, so please join us if you can. Uh, unfortunately, Casey's not going to be able to join us. Uh, but uh, have to have a beer for him. That's right. That's right. That's right. And uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, happy holidays. And thanks again, Casey.